Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for Design Hacks, How to Create Visuals When It's Not Usually Your Job. My name is Holly Grant, and I'm the Learning Manager at the Institute. I'm very excited today to introduce my colleague, Beth Francesco, who will be leading the program. Beth is our Senior Director. She works on a variety of projects that all have one thing in common, the need for compelling visuals. Before joining the Institute, she oversaw student media operations at the University of Texas at Arlington, where she trained students on design, editing, reporting, leadership, and marketing. Today, she will give a presentation and then open it up for questions. Please feel free to ask a question at any point uh, using the chat feature or the Q&A buttons. If we don't have time to answer your question, we will follow up with you by email. We will also be sharing a recording of this program later today, in addition to a copy of the slides and a brief survey to help inform future programming. Thanks again for joining us, and here is Beth. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to just take one second. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to take one second and share the screen so that you can see the presentation. One second. This will just take a minute. All right. So you should be seeing the intro slide. Um, I'm going to wait for Holly to give me the thumbs up that we're good to go on that. Excellent. Um, just want to say thank you again for being here for Design Hacks, How to Create Visuals When You're Not a Designer. Um, really excited to see that we have a full house for this program, which is geared toward people who are new to design or who don't have access to some of the high power tools that some of the pros have. I am not, uh, my name, let me just say this. Oops. Um, my name is Beth Francesco, as Holly mentioned. Um, I am not a day-to-day -day designer by title and haven't been in years. But really, visuals are everyone's job now. Having an eye for visuals that can complement and enhance storytelling and a user's perception and understanding of the world around them is such an important, valuable skill. And employers notice when you have that as part of your portfolio. It can really give you an edge. I do a lot of varying work during the day. So focusing in on designing can be really challenging especially coming up with something new or innovative at the last minute. So today I'm going to be sharing some of the tools and methods that have helped me. They certainly won't cover all that is available, and there are a lot of tools available. I'm really grateful for those of you who shared some of what you'd like to learn today. I think we'll hit most of those notes. If we don't, we can certainly talk offline. So what we're going to cover today um, are some foundations and rules of thumb that are going to guide your decisions on arrangements, fonts, colors, and images. We're also going to be covering tools you have at your fingertips to make quick work of visuals. Social cards, callouts, basic or complex infographics, and more without a lot of help. We're also going to talk about a few exercises that can help you develop your design thinking. And then, of course, we'll have some time for questions at the end. After this presentation, as Holly mentioned, you will receive the slides. We're also going to feature some of the tips and tools in our upcoming newsletters, so you can keep an eye on them there. Let's get started. Let's talk some of the basics. There are some basic principles that can help us achieve design that is helpful to the end user, but that doesn't mean the concepts are any by, easy by any means. Let's walk through some of what, help, what helps the design work. Starting with hierarchy and emphasis. What this means is visually ranking different elements in a design that will help guide the viewer through the design and can help portray information in a way that shows an order of importance. Having good hierarchy in your design can help visually tell the viewer where to look first and then influences the order in which they take in the information. So having one point of emphasis and then guiding them through the rest of it. So, so here in this example that's highlighted, your eye is drawn to the larger image then loops around to the smaller image, and then your eye is forced to go to the text below. Hierarchy is an essential tool for publication, page design, and ad design. I hope you'll notice next time that you're reading a print edition of your favorite publication, where your eyes tend to go and how you're guided by the photo and headline sizes to help you rank where to look first. Next, we're going to talk about proximity and grouping. Grouping related elements together can help give your design order and keep things organized. Creating relationships between the elements that you have and organizing information in a design that is thoughtful helps the viewer digest the information in an orderly way. 
Here, the items are grouped by shape, which gives a solid line or focal point for readers that guides them into the next shape or rank of images. Again, thinking back to that hierarchy um, that we just talked about. Next, we'll talk about alignment. And alignment, we're talking about, you typically think about whether something is right aligned or left aligned. But alignment means placing text or other visual elements that they line up in a to create a composed image. Having good alignment helps your design look more orderly, more organized, balanced, and, and intentional. Alignment can help define boundaries without having to resort to using rules, um, which sometimes can help us define spaces as well. Next, let's talk about contrast. Contrast is when we create a visual distinction between two elements or sets of elements. Contrast is really attractive to the eye. Um, it helps organize information. It can help with legibility and creates a nice interest within a design so that not everything looks the same. You'll often see this in lists where, um, in publications where you'll have a, a, a row of white text and then you'll reverse it to a gray text with white text on it, or sorry, a gray background with white text on it. Um, it helps to visually break up and help organize content. It can also help grab your viewer's attention and create focus so that you can clearly communicate your message. You can create contrast in a lot of different ways, using color as this uh, example does, using size, uh, small and large images, uh, any typography choices or font choices that you make, um, or utilizing unique design elements like patterns or textures, uh, shapes, everything like that. So contrast you can, can appear in many different ways um, and they can be really helpful in um, giving your design, whatever it might be, some visual interest. The next thing we'll talk about is negative space, which is the empty space in a design that doesn't contain content. A lot of times people will refer, will refer to this as white space, but it doesn't necessarily have to be white. But it is the space that is between, around, um, between, around, above, or below design elements. Um, using negative space effectively can really help give elements that you are designing the room to breathe and it can help give the focus on, keep the focus on your point of emphasis or your message. In this image, the, neg the yellow is the negative or unused space. So your eye is forced to, uh, forced to attention on the blue dot. Negative space can be a really powerful way to um, direct your users to look at essential information. Imagine this were, for example, a message, um, a two or three word um, punchy directive or call to action. You're, you're going to be forced into it by the negative space. Next, we'll talk about repetition. Using elements um, that are similar, have similar characteristics can really create consistency within a design. What's gonna result is a cohesive aesthetic that will, if you're really strategic about your choices and which characteristics you're grouping, can ensure that you're on brand as well. Um, and people typically think about on brand as referring to um, promotional material or um, any other type of material that nece doesn't necessarily do with, have to do with editorial, but that's not the case. Um, every editorial publication is a brand. And so having cohesive um, systems in place to help you enforce that brand is important. So these choices about repetition or negative space so or color really all play into that. Um, on repetition though, when there is a lack of some similarity between items, the result can feel like it's disjointed or chaotic and your message, it may be a great message, but it will be unclear, which can really distract readers from what you're trying to get them to do. Um, repetition or using similar characteristics can um, also be very effective in creating an impactful dominant image when you're trying to make up, um, sorry, can be effective in creating an impactful uh, dominant image made up of smaller, less impactful images. So let's say, for example, um, you could have a really powerful photo, for example, from a peaceful protest that has taken place. Um, and that is wonderful and cre can create a visual um, distinction but let's say perhaps you wanna show multiple photos, you can group them in a way that can also create a dominant image. Again, referring back to the, the concept of hierarchy, um, you can draw people in with a grouping of images that creates a larger image. Last, we'll talk about, last we'll talk about balance. 
And then balance, as you can see here, is placing elements in a way that distribute, distributes the uh, visual weight equally in the design and ensures the viewer's eye moves easily from one element to the next. When you step back from your design, you want it to have a feeling of completeness and wholeness. And while an unbalanced design uh, won't feel right, um, it could give you, when it doesn't feel right, it can give you the sense of tension and again, doesn't say where to direct the eye. Here, you can see that while there are two elements on the right side of the, the scale, they are of equal size and weight when combined to, this, to the single image on the left. So those are some pic bigger picture um, foundational things to keep in mind. And there you're probably thinking, well, that's great, Beth, but what does that mean for me? Um, let's talk about some of the things that you're more likely to encounter once you get past what you want to do with your design. Um, here are some things that you can focus on now. Again, basic does not mean simple. <laughs> and basic, the, learning the basics helps you make complicated decisions every day. Starting with readability. Often, things that affect readability um, are things that you have a lot of control over. If your infographic is pretty but not readable, it is useless to users. So you really have to think about a couple of things, including, and you'll hear this from me throughout, that you have to think about where your design, whether it is a social media card, a, um, an infographic that you're going to include on your website, but that is also going to be used in print, you have to think about where that graphic or image is going to live once you're finished with it, because there are a number of things that can impact um, its legibility for your end user. And everything you do is for your end user. It, our job is to make things as um, uncomplicated as possible for them. So we have to think, is this going to go on social? Is this going to be packaged with a story on our CMS? Like our CMS? Is it going in a printed document? What size is that printed document? So some rules of thumb to go by are, try not to use any text smaller than nine point. Although you're gonna be tempted to try smaller, try not to, or just avoid it if you can. Graphics don't resize proportionally across platforms. Some, um, I'll, I'll say this from experience from our site at the Institute, will resize an image from the center out, which means that typefaces can get um, crunched or enlarged because of the way that that system is set up. So you really need to know your systems, but it can also be helpful to design with these things in mind and, and size appropriately from the start. You also wanna think, can other people read this? Your eyes and your eyesight are very different than the person is, who is sitting next to you. Specifically, I ask myself if my mom could read this without squinting whenever I make something. And also, hi, mom, I know you're watching, so hello. <laughs> um, but I ask myself, is this going to be um, readable or legible to someone who may have um, a different ability, eyesight ability than myself. Really, it comes back to don't make things difficult for our end users. You also want to consider um, the mandates from, uh, through the Americans with Disability Act on certain websites. We have a number of viewers today who are from educational or government agencies. The ADA outlines a number of requirements having to do with readability specifically on digital outputs. We won't get into them here, but it's something to consider and note. Even if you're not mandated to, um, to follow these requirements, it can be very helpful for those readers that you're trying to get um, if you can remove some of those barriers from the start. The other thing I wanna think about is that reverse type, which is the um, type you can see here on the blue, uh, the bottom graphic, where we have dark blue on a lighter blue background. It's called reverse type. Uh, you want to be careful about um, any type that you onset, sorry, that you set onto a backdrop of color because it can be, create some difficulties, especially if you don't have a large enough contrast. And again, we want to remove those difficulties. I grabbed this sam these samples from the Institute's Twitter feed. Um, we have two great programs uh, coming up, by the way. So if you see and note details on that, you should uh, pay attention to those. Um, but they showed really different ways of conveying the information. Note the um, handwritten information on the NPR update. It's legible, it's large enough, um, and it's a black on white background, which is a very common background. Um, the method of handwriting, note too, also makes it much more personal and really the perfect tone for an Ask Me Anything session. The program on the bottom is different. Um, it, that does contain, it, the graphic itself contains a lot of information 
um, and it really forces smaller type. When you add the reverse type in or that contrast of blue on blue, um, it makes it a little tougher to read, um, especially for those with aging eyes or maybe color blindness. So just things to consider. This, these aren't necessarily bad, but they could be improved. Just thought. Just a thought. Sorry about that. Hi, next... We actually have our first question. Oh, great. So one of our participants says that they have a little bit of difficulty choosing color schemes for figures. Are there any online resources that you know of that can help with that? Yes, actually, we're going to talk about color in just a minute um, and can share. Uh, thank you, Holly, by the way, for the question. And thank you to the to whoever asked it. We're going to share a little bit about color in just a minute. Um, but there, and I'll, I can share some resources toward the end that can help with those choices. Thank you. Keep the questions coming. Um, another thing that you'll want to consider is um, remaining concise with what you're including. Um, try not to use any more words than necessary in your graphic or design, whether it's an, infograph an information graphic or if it's a social card or promotion for something that's coming up. One exercise that I, um, I challenge myself to do is to always eliminate three words and then another three words and then another three words. And you're gonna be really surprised that if you challenge yourself to eliminate, you'll su be surprised at what you eliminate and that how that, can, that exercise can get you to what you're really trying to convey with this limited space, in this limited space. Um, another thing to think about is to avoid um, bad breaks. And what we mean by that are when we split phrases or have hyphenated words um, within our images or graphics, we want to avoid that. Um, usually just with a hard return can take care of it. We have another question uh, coming in. Um, give me just a second and I will um, get to it. Another thing to think about with being concise is to think about um, easy vocabulary that are going to be, that's going to be very um, easy to understand. Remember that you're writing and designing for, skimmer, for skimmers. A lot of people are not going to stop and spend time with what you're working on unless it's easy to understand and it captures their attention. So the shorter words you have that convey your message, the better, and it'll allow you to really focus in on the visuals that are gonna capture their attention. Um, and then again, remember that when you're thinking about social and web usage, for any digital image, uh, sorry, any digital usage for your work, you have a lot of room with your share text or supplemental text on the web to help get your points across. So you don't have to include every single thing in your visual. You can use the, um, as, as Bootstrap does here, um, it has a nice image, but really it focuses in on what the new additions to this particular um, update are. And it doesn't have to be included in that visual because it could get lost very easily. Okay, let's get to our next slide, which is on photo quality or image quality. When you're thinking about things like photo quality, it's really important to remember that the closer you get to an original image, uh, the more options you're going to have, opportunities you're going to have to resize what you're working with. Um, it is always great to ask for the original image when you're initially re requesting permission to use photos. And you do need to request permission for using photos, any photos. Um, most people in this audience are here to create commercial work either for themselves or for their company. So please don't make assumptions about copyrights, which we'll talk about in just a little bit too. We have a question, a couple questions. Um, one from Chris uh, referring to the, the phrase share text um, used in the pr previous slide. Yes, um, so when we say share text, we mean any additional text that goes along with the image. So this would be what your actual tweet is um, on the, on the uh, image that you're sharing. That could include a link to more information. Um, so if we go back, sorry, getting ahead of myself. If we go back, this, I don't know if you can see my arrow, this is your share text and that does include the link. So you see how this text describes what is in this new um, feature of Bootstrap. So here, this is just like a, a basic promotion to grab your attention. The details are listed here. So you'll see this sometimes with like 
probably the, the easiest example is like an event. So you can see maybe um, in the visual piece of it, it would have the basics of like, what's the name of the event, um, time, date, place. And then up here in the share text, it would be who's speaking, what they're talking about, a little bit more to entice. This gets your attention, the visual gets your attention, the details are in that share text. Okay, ooh, this is a good question also posed in, in the chat. How do you personally start the creative process when choosing images? We are gonna get to that. We have some exercises that I think will be helpful for you. Okay. I wanna be um, mindful of time um, and to try to get to as many questions as possible. Okay, so let's talk about photo quality. Like I said, you wanna make sure you got original photos. You wanna consider where you're placing your photos. Um, once you save your graphic or visual, like we said earlier, the platform that you use to distribute it may not size it appropriately. You really wanna be careful about putting type on photos and it's a very popular thing to do with stock images right now. Um, and for those of you working in newsrooms, you might be tempted to use uh, type on a news photo. Uh, my rule of thumb um, that I've always followed is just don't do it. I did it one time a long time ago and I got a tongue lashing from the uh, photographer who'd worked very hard on that image. Remember that these images are not just things that, are, especially when it's work from your colleagues, it's not just work that um, is done and there for you to, to manipulate at will. Um, if you do feel like putting type on a news photo is important and something you wanna do, talk with the photographer. The last thing you wanna do is surprise them, especially because again, they put a lot of work into what they're doing, the same that you do. Um, when using type on a stock photo, consider where the points of focus are, where the action is happening. If it's a handshake, you probably, that you're trying to emphasize, you probably don't wanna put text over it. Um, or if you have faces, be careful about putting type over faces. And that would be for any photo. And then of course, you wanna select images that have either a singular focus or action point, or one that is generic enough that you can manipulate it without dissolving quality. All right, I wanna get through these so that I can get to the tools as quickly as possible. Let's see, all right. So um, one thing that I think we can all agree on is that when things get really, um, when, when things get really jumbled or when you feel confused about where to look in a, um, in a, in a graphic, it's usually because um, the designer has gone, you know, it's like fonts gone wild. Uh, we really wanna make sure that we're limiting fonts to um, things that are going to be readable, things that convey the tone of, a, um, of your organization or the message you're trying to get across. Um, and I will just point out that the example shown here is not one that I would follow. This is a bad, bad quote card. Um, and it was really hard to design because I, it broke every, every, everything in me to make this. Um, so let's talk about it. Um, somebody asked earlier about um, brand consistency. I saw this in the chat. I think Juliet asked, thank you, Juliet. Um, if your publication or organization has a style guide, style guide or brand identity guide, get familiar with it and you shouldn't veer from it too often. That said, um, let's explain what a style guide is. Most newspapers, agencies or professional organizations, our nonprofit has a brand identity guide. It outlines the colors, fonts, um, and uh, you know, how to use the logo, things like that. Uh, other things that we're discussing today that we can that help create consistency in a brand and can create an identity. If you're freelancing or pitching a story that you hope to include a graphic with, I know we have a lot of freelancers here today, you want to make sure that you ask for the style guide on the front end. A lot of people don't do that. And if you're planning to do some kind of graphic on your own and share it as part of your story, it can really help you um, get an edge uh, with your uh, with your piece and getting it accepted because you don't, uh, others may not have that skill and you're saving that publication some time. Um, Juliet's question was, can, you know, how do you, how do you bend the rules? And I would certainly uh, say that when you if, you, if you make exceptions to rules all the time, then you don't really have rules. <laughs> so um, it would be when you have a really good reason. If you can look and like hopefully this presentation can help prepare you with some of the, the language and the reasoning behind um, why you would want to break with what the norm is for your publication or your agency. Um, but I think the best way to get around or to bend rules is to have a really good reason. And I feel like it is not really a great reason. 
Um, I've tried that a lot of times. It doesn't fly with editors. So um, I would have a conversation with whoever is the, the decision maker at the end of the day, or even up front to say what you think is special. The thing is, if everything is treated as though it's special, every, like, let's say, example, for example, in this graphic, if, you know, perfection here is highlighted, so that means it's special. The nothing more is bold and italicized, so that's being treated in a special way. Then we have the script font. Then we have the yellow underline and bold. And then we have the backdrop on the bottom. If everything is special, nothing is special. And we don't know where to go. That's, that's the point with the fonts, but it applies to the bigger brand identity piece too. If you're consistent all the time for your users, and then you could, uh, and then you make a break, they're gonna notice. But if, they're not, if there's not a consistency to start, it can be really challenging for them to understand who you are as a publication and, or designer. Um, and then what to expect from you. I hope that makes sense. I can also clarify later if, if you'd like. Um, one thing to keep in mind too, getting back to fonts, is that if you don't have a style guide or if you do have permission to stray from it once you have these conversations, it's really best to stick with two um, font families, one serif and one sans serif, um, and then work within those. Because there are a lot of ways to make, take advantage of font families. You can use bold, italicized, different weights um, to create and sizes, to create different looks and appeal. And again, this is not a great example, so that's the whole purpose is don't do this. <laughs> um, but we wanna make sure that you have, um, have limited, you limit to make things special when they need to be special. And then the other thing to consider is mobile readiness. How is something going to appear on a phone screen? Um, and then just keep in mind that the font that you select could be changed to match th that system's template. Um, for example, we took we put a lot into selecting the um, selecting the font for our institute's newsletter, and on some systems, depending on where you're looking at it, it reverts to whatever um, I, I think it's like Arial or like a system font. So you just want to make sure that if you do something that is a little bit different, that that you want to make sure that you um, that you uh, consider where it's going to land as well and how it might be modified. Thank you, Julie, for the link in the chat for the uh, difference between serif and sans serif fonts. I could talk all day about this, so. um, but we don't, we're going to run out of time. Um, let's talk about color. Um, again, too many colors or color combinations can be a distraction, can cause confusion for the reader. So a couple of things, you want to make sure that you follow your organization's style guide or brand identity guide. Um, and use the color palette that it outlines. If they don't have one or doesn't outline, you can select colors. This gets back to an earlier question. Um, this, in, these instructions came from HubSpot, um, but to consider your context, you know, how are you using this? What's the tone that you're trying to convey? Uh, things like that. And then you can use a color wheel. So um, here we have a color wheel. And if you're familiar um, with, um, with this, actually, also when we send the link out later with the slides, I'll make sure I include um, a link to a really good explanation of how to use color wheels. But you can use a color wheel to identify similar colors. Monochromatic schemes, for example, are, are colors within the same hue group, and um, it can be really helpful. It's a really professional way to approach something. You can also create contrast, like we talked about earlier, by using complementary colors. Um, I'm gonna show you some tools in a little bit that make this really easy because the preset color schemes are already matched um, and can really, then it gives you a place to start and then you can modify rather than starting from scratch. Okay, so the other, last thing on, on color is to consider the tone. Um, you wouldn't use Halloween's black and orange color screen scheme, for example, on the 4th of July, right? So a graphic on COVID-19 deaths in your county is best probably with limited color because of the because of the nature of what it's trying to convey. If you're doing an infographic on, say, the top houseplant purchases online during quarantine, which is a search I recently did, um, an infographic would likely be green to match up with the houseplant concept. So just think about what you're trying to convey and select. Start with selection, selecting something, and then um, work your way through those, some of those questions. Let's see, um, we have a lot to get through, so I wanna be careful. 
about time. Um, don't write all this down. You're going to get this in email. Um, we've m mentioned a couple of times that it's important to know from the start where your, where your work is going to live once it's finished. Um, so this chart outlines some of the places that my colleague Holly and I create graphics for. You'll see that it's a lot of social. It can be a good starting point for you or your team. Um, I would suggest using this as a starting point if you don't already have one. When you get this, download it and then add to this table um, other dimensions that are important to you and your team. Things like your web um, image dimensions, any print dimensions or other internal dimensions. If you have, for example, a break room, once you go back to the office where you do flyers to talk about what's coming up, um, it could be really helpful that way. And these are up to date as of last night. So <laughs> hopefully that's helpful. There were others available, but this is what we most frequently use. Um, we'll get into the second part of this presentation, and I really want to be careful about time, um, but we can go over a little. I've got time afterwards, so if you guys want to stick around, you certainly can. Um, what really matters, I mean, that's a lot of foundation. It's a lot of the details and things to consider. There are always exceptions to the rule. <laughs> um, what I learned, I learned from someone else and learned from someone else, and we all are learning in different ways. Um, we pick up what works and we experiment and we do things differently so that we can um, learn and grow from them and, and try new things. But what really matters at the end of the day is that you practice purpose in every decision, even when you're on a deadline. So if you can't think about why you're doing something or you haven't thought about why you're doing something, why you're using that color, why this font, then you're really not challenging yourself to do the best work that you can. Sometimes you just have to get things done, I understand. But we really have to think about practicing purpose. And our purpose at the end of the day is to make things easy for the people at the end of the line who are looking at this particular piece. If something isn't coherent, if something is not legible, it's useless and people, you get a split second to get their attention and to educate. And that's a lot to put on one graphic, but you have a lot of control over that. So some things to think about in that regard are, you know, what's the goal with this piece? What does the end user need to know? If, you know, if you're a writer, think about it, like what's the lead for this graphic? Where will this piece be used? I'm gonna emphasize that over and over again. Is this the piece, is this piece the only way that I have to convey that message? I have a couple of questions about the share text in our, our chat room. So I'll make sure we address those um, probably in the follow-up email. Um, let's see, if you're thinking about a call out or info box, you know, how do you decide what should be in a box? Good examples are how to's, steps, uh, lists, data, that, uh, data that can, if written would be confusing. Um, you wanna think about what a reader can needs and then could digest easily in a quick skim. We could really do an entire program on examples of call outs and then specifically how to build them. If you're interested in that, make sure you put that in the survey when we send it out later this afternoon. One other thing, it is really hard to design any graphic if you don't have information that you need. Um, so you have to really be thinking about what is going to help a reader from the start of your reporting process. Um, if you're a reporter, a writer, editor, thinking about how you can incorporate more graphics and how you can build them, you can't really build anything if you don't have content. Uh, content dictates design. And so be thinking about as you're gathering your material, um, you are going to, um, you know, some of the things that you don't use in your actual story would make a great graphic because it can add context or um, give people another insight into the topic that you're covering. And in the end, at the end of the day, when you design, you need to think about what's going to make things easiest for your reader. You're trying to improve their life, not make things more complicated. So a couple of people are asking for tools. That's the fun part of this. Lecture over. So free tools. We're going to talk about, let me just take a drink of water real quick. Okay. Free tools. Um, stock images. Uh, these are free places that you can get images, vector, sorry, vector images, photographs, stock images, things that you can use. Um, they have, I'll talk about licenses in just a minute, but Creative Commons is probably the most commonly known. Uh, Paxels is good. Pixabay is featured here. You can see that I did a search for coronavirus. Um, and these, there's a variety of images. It's not just photos. There are some illustrations. 
there is a you know the graphic itself um, up here it says sponsored images these are things you can pay for all of these free sites are going to have a paid component if you wish to go there but a lot of them do not so lots of different things some of them editorialized some of them very straightforward can be used in a variety of ways um, free pick and then uh, stock snap is another one um, always review site licensing and credit requirements sorry crediting requirements the photographer may want to be credited and may require that you say where they got it from and then um, let's see some you want to also make sure um, that some don't allow for commercial use um, so you really want to make sure you read the fine print um, before you use one of these images a lot of people on this call are using these graphics or building things for commercial purposes um, or political use and some will bar some of these bar them um, my suggestion would be to get like pick one of these take some time to, to look at each of these do some searches that are common for you and your team pick one or two and then get really familiar with their licenses you don't have to use all five of these every time you need an image but if you find one better suits your needs than others then that's that's the one to go to and get familiar with the terms of service Another set of free tools that you have um, relate to news and other images. So you have probably, I've been guilty of this, looked through, you know, quick search on Google for an image. I'm like, oh, that would be great. And then I can't, you know, you're not allowed to use it because you don't know where it came from. Or you're on Twitter and you're like, I'll just do a screen grab of this particular person's photo. That is not okay. <laughs> um, these images, again, are the hard work of a photographer or graphic artist, um, illustrator artist, who have worked on these pieces. So you want to ask, you need to ask, you must ask permission from the person, agency, or group that owns the rights to the image. So it's not that hard to do. Um, you just, you know, if somebody shares something on Twitter, DM them, hey, do you know who owns this photo? And then contact that person. Just because someone is using a photo doesn't mean that it's theirs to grant permission on. So it does take a little legwork. It's not something you want to try to do at the last minute. Um, try to do it in the early stages of, of what you're thinking about. You'll want to explain how you intend to use the photo. Are you going to modify it? Are you going to republish it? Is it commercial? And then you want to ask how the person would like to be credited and whether you can archive the image. This is tricky and it's important to pay attention to, especially in newsrooms. If you get permission one, for one-time use on an image, used in a graphic, or used for republication, and then you archive it as normal, somebody behind you a year or two from now could go in, use that, and then repurpose. That could be uh, legal action, as Alan just points out in the chat. You wanna be very careful about what you're using, and you have to make the effort, and you have to have the permission. Don't take it on the phone. <laughs> Don't take it verbally. Get written permission, an email is fine. Um, remember that you're asking, this is not something where you use and then beg forgiveness later. That does not work with copyright, especially on images. Um, one other way to get a quick response would be to reach out through social media and email, not just email. Um, and then one other way that you can get um, free tools is to spend a little time up front getting permission to use your organization's previously published photos. Um, if you're a newsroom, know the archiving system, spend a little time on naming conventions. If you're a nonprofit or education organization, you could look into partnerships with a local paper for blanket access to the work. You can ha have a written agreement that credits out, uh, outlines crediting and things like that. Um, another would be to brainstorm themes that come up often on your beat or within your organization and then build your own image file. Everybody has a pretty powerful tool in their, in their, cam uh, in their phone with the camera quality that we have now. So take your own photos, review what you have on hand from previous events, and see what you can come up with to create your own system. And then it's always important to tag photos in a way that are easily searchable. Let's get to paid tools, which Alan brings up. Um, we do have Adobe stock images that are available. Um, Shutterstock has photos and vector images. Um, I stock photo and then vector stock vector stock is just free um, is free, but it's only for personal use. If it's free. There are other things. Here is a, a an example of uh, What came up when I searched racism on I stock 
a photo yesterday. So you can see it's a variety of illustrations, it's stock images, things like that that you can use. Um, I just want to make sure that I say that for purposes of clarity, the National Press Club Journalism Institute doesn't endorse any of these products. <laughs> um, I've used them, and my friends have used them for freelance or previous work, but again, we're not saying that any one of these you should go spend money on. They're just options for you to consider. Um, Alan, thank you for pointing out the Adobe uh, Photo Stock subscription. Um, hopefully that's going to be help. These other products can be helpful as well. Somebody asked earlier about photo editing tools. Um, we've got some free photo editors you can use. Here's my dog Nelson making his first appearance in the slideshow. Um, here we've got, um, this is using Adobe Photoshop Express on my phone. Um, we also have uh, you can see here too, like by knock, it makes it easy to do things like knockouts. So I've taken away the background, but it's still there. But by using that red, it really emphasizes him and his uh, his coolness by knocking out the distracting background. Um, but that's a really simple thing to use on your phone. You also have these other three. Uh, somebody asked about a resizing app that is very. Um, easy to use is this resizing Chrome, this Chrome extension called resizing.app. Um, I would download this right away. <laughs> it's been very handy uh, for me as I do my work day to day, but it can help you easily resize images. Um, and I really hope that that's helpful. Okay, I'm trying to fly through these. Okay, I really wish that we had time to do demos for these. If you're interested, let us know. Um, Let's see. Oh, Mark, thank you so much for the, the comments about the free visual visuals from the Library of Congress. That's great. And then the others listed here. Thank you. Um, free tools for design and graphics. Um, Canva is probably the best known um, in, it is in, in my circles. Um, there's also Crello, Infogram, uh, Data Wrapper, and then Gravit Designer. I don't have listed on here, but I'll include it in our slide later. It's more for advanced users. Um, but these are great tools. Here's a sample um, of what, like, what the worksheet looks like for Canva on a, on a Twitter quote, quote card. It literally gives you a bank of already built um, cards. They have social posts, they have flyers, they have brochures. If you're not familiar, I really recommend looking into it. Um, you can easily look at this pull, I wish I could do a demo, but um, pull it over and then start manipulating. Um, they have pre-built text They have uh, that, that takes the font choices. You still have choices, but it already marries serif and sans serif fonts together in a way that you can grab the ones that are most appropriate for you, change the font, change the background, put your message in, and share it directly to Twitter or whatever, wherever you want to go with it. So I would suggest looking at it. Crello is very similar. Um, and then I want to show you one thing I did, if you're really interested in infographics, um, this is an infographic that I built in a matter of four, four minutes. The, um, uh, I used your registration information for people on this call, mapped out where our viewers from this session are from. When you scroll over each state when it's live, it tells you how many people from this session are actually from that state. It's embeddable on a website. It can be formatted for print or social. All it took was uploading the spreadsheet and selecting colors. So um, again, a very easy tool if you're really just dabbling into visualizing data, this is a really good way to get started. Um, all these tools take a lot of practice. They're great. Um, allow yourself the time. Um, uh, this is from, uh, this is Infogram. Uh, this map is from Infogram to answer the question on chat. Um, these all take practice. Um, Allow your, yourself time off deadline to explore them. Uh, you can get ideas too from the pre-built templates that can help, help influence the type of information you're gathering. Um, remember that content drives design. And if you don't have content, you can't make up for it at the end of the day, just create it. So just be very, very careful. Um, I guess the, let's see. Other thing I wanna show you as a tool and resource would be, um, some of the places that you can capture inspiration or find inspiration. And that would be, um, like this is an example, Visual Capitalist is a great site. That all it does is build infographics and it builds it in very like, the, as you can see here, complex ways, but it can really be ins inspiration for color usage, for how to break down information, how to arrange elements, that kind of thing. Highly recommend it. Also suggest creating a Pinterest board 
so that you could bookmark um, things that, uh, styles that you like, colors, designs, things like that. Um, also, if you go on Pinterest and Google like graphic design or um, photography, you can get some great ideas um, there. And then of course, um, I like to use uh, the, the Pocket Chrome extension so that as I'm going through websites, particularly for digital design, I can just quickly save something and move forward. Um, let's see. How are we doing? I know that we are right at 12.15. Um, I'd like to keep going if that's okay. Are we good to keep going? Holly tells me we can. Feel free to hop off. Um, you can look at the recording of this um, if you have other things to do. But I did want to share just um, I have one more slide. Um, it is talking about some of the ways that you can build experience by um, practicing and by, by doing different things. Um, oh, okay. All right. Good. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks for the go ahead. Um, okay, so all right. Practicing. Um, let's start with one of the things that um, I was asked when, when Julie, our executive director, and I started talking about what this program might include. Um, the how came up. How do you get from point A to point B? Um, how do you get uh, from a concept to an actual designed piece? Um, and that was actually one of the questions that uh, came up earlier that I saw. Um, one way is one thing to keep in mind is there's, there's not one set creative process and a lot of times things happen by, by uh, collaboration and talking things through with your team. Um, so one thing that I like to do as a team and also as an individual when I'm on deadline is to use a word association game. Um, this is really helpful for visualizing conceptual topics. For the Institute, my work includes a lot of, we, like, we do programs. And so when we think about things like, you know, um, writing in short bursts or design hacks, you know, there's not really a singular image that comes to mind. So we have to mine a little deeper to find a, a, you know, a, a photo or image that will best convey a, you know, a sense of whatever that word or phrase is. Um, so let's play a word association game, if you guys will um, indulge me. So if your chat function is not already open, can you click it open? And I'm going to give you a word. And here it's as simple as this. We're going to take one minute, 60 seconds. I'm going to tell you the word, and then I want you, whatever pops into your mind about that word or in reference to that word or related to that word, I want you to enter it into the chat, okay? And we're going to do a minute. So as many words come to mind, put it in the chat. Got it? All right. So the word is community. This is great. Good job. If you put one word in and you think you're done, keep going. We saw 20 seconds. This is great. Okay. If you're in the middle of it, go ahead and type it in. Okay, so you saw, if you scroll back through your chat, you can see that some of us thought about community the same, some of us thought about it differently. That is all really important part of this process of what are those associated words. So when you do this with the team, it's really great because you can see themes emerge. You know, one thing that, um, I'm gonna just pick one. It doesn't mean that it's better than any other. It's just that it's, it's one that, that came to my mind as well. And that, that idea of neighbors and neighborhood. Okay, so let's play off of that. Um, once you start, you get this list going, and you, again, you can do this individually, you can do it as a group. It's not about how many times a word arises, it's what strikes best for what you're trying to convey. So community is a broad you know, concept, right? Um, 
very concrete definition, but a broad concept, we interpret it differently. Um, so let's take neighborhood. We're thinking visually, right? So when I say neighborhood, what images come to mind? You can put them in the chat if you want, but you don't have to. Um, so, you know, probably like fences or parks or um, what other things happen for a neighbor? Kids playing together. When you start thinking about these visual ways to illustrate this concept of community via this vehicle, the neighborhood, right? This idea of what the neighborhood is in relation to community, you start getting really searchable terms for these stock image sites. So just be thinking about that. Um, you get a lot of words related to a word or concept, and then you start thinking about what photos or images can relate to some of those words. And then of course, um, you wanna start putting it through this process we've already talked about. This is where you think about the purpose and function of what you're designing. Does the tone of a fence really um, convey community? Not really, right? So we probably wanna toss that one, um, at least depending on the, the context for what we're trying to convey. Um, does this type of image, whatever you decide to go uh, forward with, stereotype a group of people or your audience? So we had um, church family come up, church community come up. So, uh, and, and it's a great one. We wanna think though, when we start putting in church community into um, church or worship into a, a stock image site, what's gonna come up? Is it gonna be something that really focuses in on Christianity or is it, you know, does that then disengage anybody who is not uh, of that faith? So this is where you start to really drill in on like, what is the tone? What are we trying to convey? Is this inclusive? If that's what your goal is. Functionally, you wanna think about whether the image can resize. Um, can you buy the image? Is it even you know, something that you can put in your price range? Things like that. Yes, you consider your audience for the article when you're choosing your photo. Absolutely, Alan, good question. Um, so that's the, that's the word association game. We can do this a lot of different ways, um, but I like that a lot for, for getting from a concept to something that is concrete. Another thing that you can do is headline practice. Um, in this exercise, what we're doing is trying to edit our text to essentials that, influence, that then will influence our image selection. So for this exercise, which we're not gonna do together because I wanna be mindful and respectful of your time, you would set a timer for two minutes. And it really needs to be two minutes. You would start the timer. Your objective is to write as many separate, distinct headlines for the infographic you're doing as you can within those two minutes. You should let them vary. They would play off of each other. They can be clever, be straightforward. There's supposed to be a lot of variety, right? Or let them flow. If they start going toward a certain direction, you are very focused on what your objective is. Once your time is complete and it needs to be the two minutes, once you think you're done, you're not done until that timer goes off. You wanna select one of those headlines, either as is or try combining several once you start looking at them. And then select visuals using that phrase or headline. Even if you end up using a different, like different text for the intro or the actual headline on your thing, you're really trying to use a headline exercise to um, connect with a visual. So that's just another exercise that you might wanna try. And then um, some other practice that I, I, I found this yesterday, it was really cool. Um, this typed connection, you'll have the link in the slideshow when you get it, is um, it's actually a typographic dating game that where you match fonts based on their characteristics that you're trying to get them to date. Like, do they actually work together? Um, I played it a couple times, it was a little addictive and it teaches you a lot about each font um, if you're really interested in diving into more of that. And then there's a hue test um, that, asks you to arrange colors based on uh, monochromatic schemes. So you can really see how uh, images, and, uh, sorry, how colors work together uh, to create um, a, a strong effect. So I would recommend both of those as well. And you'll have the link in here too. <laughs> I don't know, Alan, if Hue test comes with a cry test. <laughs> I'm sure it does. Um, so that's, that's the end of the presentation. I am so sorry that we went over on time. I hope that this was helpful. Um, I can, we can look a little bit at the questions here. We probably need to release for the day, but you're certainly welcome to contact me on Twitter. I'm at Beth Francesco. Um, my email address for the Press Institute is bfrancesco at press.org. I am more than happy to take any questions. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about this, uh, any of these particular topics, I hope you'll consider 
uh, letting us know in the survey so that we can plan more programming. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can jump on with Holly. Hi, Beth. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. We really hope you enjoyed this. And as we mentioned, we will definitely share all the materials, answer any of your questions. And we also would appreciate if you guys would respond to a survey um, just to help us inform future programming. And if you have time next week, please join us on June 24th. We have another program. Um, this one's called Working Through Revising Your Emotional Story and it features writers Elizabeth Flock and Lori Gottlieb. Um, we also have a daily newsletter that is for journalists, um, so we encourage you to sign up on our website. We'll also put that in the email. Um, so thank you and have a great day. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you.